you're from Nigeria and you've been out there, like you said right now, you're in exile because of some of your activities. Tell us what it was. My dad died and it was, was, a, it was an extremely random kind of death. And I thought to myself that these people are the enemy and the way to fight this enemy is to use exposure. Because it seems like that freedom of speech you've been exercising has been under threat. So I was accused of many things. I was accused of terrorism. I was accused of treason. Treason in Nigeria is a capital punishment. The very first person to threaten was a family member. And then I was getting all sorts of threats. A member of the Nigerian Special Forces sends me a message on Twitter and, and he's like, I'm going to personally cut off your head. So we sued the US Attorney's Office, we sued the FBI, CIA, the DEA, that's the Drug Enforcement Administration the IRS. It would have caused chaos. It would have completely destabilized the whole region. And apparently, Dangote was trying to... David, and David, you say your last name, Hundeyin, right? Hundeyin. Hundeyin. Well, yeah. David Hundeyin, pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> Same here. Same here. Well, David, you're probably, I think, one of the most, um, you're part of the most, some of the most fascinating Africans I know, or people in general, I know, but uh, especially in Africa. And I hope people are going to discover <laughs> alongside with me on this conversation why I say this, because it sounds like, wait, what? Um, in any case, so David, please tell us who you are and what is it that you do? So um, a writer and investigative journalist. Um, I'm from Nigeria. My work tends to focus on Nigeria and the West African sub-region. And why I guess you describe me as fascinating is because um, I've built a reputation as the, the guy who goes after the stories that nobody else wants to touch or the forbidden stories that no one else dares to go after, which I think of as the most important stories that need to be told, especially in the African um, context. And I've done so at great personal cost and risk, um, to extents which I guess, you know, even my family thinks I'm a bit crazy. Maybe I am. So that's, that's kind of my thing. That's the, the portfolio, if you like, that I've built up over the years. Um, going into a bit of a, uh, sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sabbatical now, because, um, the platform I built, West Africa Weekly, it's going, it's gone through a change in management. Um, I sold the majority stake in the platform. So there's new investors. So there's now a board. We have seven new reporters on the team. So it's a standalone organization that works without me needing to be there on a day to day basis, which I consider to be a success. So there's that. So I'm sort of taking a few months off, I guess, to sort of figure out where to go next and recharge my batteries. But yeah, that's what I've been doing up until this point. Um, I have my first book, which is called The Jungle, came out last year, in January. My second book, which is called Breaking Point, is coming out in exactly 15 days time, the 25th of January. And yeah, that's uh, a very stripped down version of my story, a stripped down and sanitized version of my story, I should add, because... Um, I guess if I were to tell the non-sanitized version that I'd also mentioned that I've, um, I currently live in exile. I was forced into uh, exile. I live on a political asylum um, as a result of the work that I do. Um, and I've made, I have, a, a, if you like, a laundry list <laughs> of some of the most powerful enemies it's possible to make on, on this side of the planet. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's my brag sheet. So we're going to unsanitize the story because we here we talk real shop. OK, so before you go back, because I'm going to take you back, I'm going to want you to take us back where you're not gone on sabbatical yet. You're not gone yet. <laughs> and if I have anything to, to do with it, you're not going to be too long on sabbatical. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, um, David, I want you to go back because, David, when I met you, I really wanted to understand why is it that David... Hundeyen is doing what he's doing. And very soon people are going to understand what it is that you're doing. And as a matter of fact, let me maybe ask you, you know, because back then, when basically what people need to know about you, and I'm going to ask you to tell the details. You are from Nigeria and you've yeah. been out there, like you said right now, you're in exile because of some of your activities. Um, being an investigative journalist 
um, just, you know, pouring your heart into very meaningful stories. I want you to tell people what is the first story that really set you on this journey of even at some point having to be in exile. Can you go back to that first story or was it a series of events that eventually led to where you are? But if you had to go back and put your finger on the one story that you put out that started you on this journey, which one would it be? And please walk us, tell us what it was. So um, when I started off on the journey, I think it actually started even before the actual story. So it was actually an incident yes. that changed changed my entire view of how the world I lived in worked. Um, so for for context, um, I was born and raised in Nigeria, but um, the Nigeria that I was born and raised in was, if I'm being modest, I'll call it an upper middle class Nigeria. Um, it, probably a bit more than upper middle class, if I'm being honest. So yeah. I was accustomed to a certain life and a certain lifestyle. And it had never genuinely occurred to me that certain things could happen to people like me or that they would happen to people like me because I was under the impression that, um, yes, as long as you worked hard and you had a you know, certain level of income and whatever, you'd be fine. So all those horrible things you read about on pages of the newspapers, on Twitter, those are things that happen to other people, not to people like me. And then in June 2017, um, my dad died. And it was, it, was a, it was an extremely random kind of death. So the night before, he was perfectly fine. It was no problem. And then he suffered a partial stroke, a survivable partial stroke, the kind that people survive everywhere on a daily basis. It really wasn't that big a deal. And what killed him was basically that ambulance just didn't show up. That's it. That's the end of the story. The ambulance just didn't show up. There was there was no reason for it not to show up. It just didn't. Right. Bear in mind we did we didn't live in some remote area or something. This is like in the middle of very accessible, middle of the city, like really upscale area, you know. It's like 10 minutes from like a, a district hospital nearby. There's no reason for the ambulance not to show up. And he just didn't show up for two hours. And he just died like in front of me. It was, it was like having an out of body experience. Like how on earth is this happening? And then when it eventually did show up, the, uh, the head of the team examined the body and told me, um, we don't carry dead bodies. And he got, a, got, a, got back to his ambulance and he drove off. Wow. So then I wow. To, and David, David, how old were you? I think it's important for people to know how old were you? And you were alone with your father. Yeah, I was I was 27 at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So And you um, did call I, the ambulance. You you did you had called the ambulance when yeah, he was having yeah. yeah. And there was there was no reason for it not to show up, but there was no reason for, for it to happen the way it did. It just did. And that on its own would have been terrible enough, right? So eventually I had to look for like a private operator that was willing to carry a corpse. And eventually we got to the, the morgue at the hospital. And then the, uh, the, the people at the morgue said, we can't accept the body. And I'm like, why? And they said, because it doesn't have a death certificate. And I'm thinking to myself, so what do you expect me to do now? Like my dad is at, at my feet in a black body bag. I have not processed the fact that this man is dead. I've not processed it. And you're telling me I need to get a death certificate. It turns out they were just looking for a bribe. So I paid 11,000 Naira, which to your American audience, that's about, that's roughly $11. So I paid them 11,000 Naira and they wrote out a death certificate for me on the spot. And uh, so on my dad's death certificate, it states that he died of psoriasis, which is basically a skin condition that he had. But obviously that's not what he died though. But the reason they yes. wrote, they put that on, on, on the death certificate is that apparently they wrote that he died of a stroke or a heart attack, whatever it was, then by law, they're required to do an autopsy. And because they issued the death certificate illegally, they couldn't do an autopsy, right? I'd heard of such things happening to other people. It never genuinely, I'd never really considered that it was possible for it to happen to me, right? Because that wasn't the Nigeria that I grew up in. I grew up in a very sort of verified type of Nigeria, right? The Nigeria that I was seeing was a Nigeria that I used to read of in the newspapers, but it never really got to me. And for the first time, I was having this, and I was sort of dunked in at the deep end. There was no, 
there's no acclimatization period. I just had to sort of figure it out. And eventually, after the funeral, I wanted to know why didn't the, the ambulance turn up? And so I, I called up the Lagos Ambulance Service. I thought that surely there must be someone to hold accountable for this. Because in my mind, this wasn't just anybody that died, you know, that, you know, that's, I should specify that there is no such thing as an acceptable death, right? Every death is regrettable. I thought this was someone who, by Nigerian standards, in the Nigerian context, was a very important person. So if he died for such a silly reason, surely there has to be some mechanism in place to hold someone accountable. And I found out that there just wasn't. Because I sent emails, I called, I showed up in person, I tried to pursue the issue for months, and eventually... I actually had a face-to-face -face meeting with someone one day, and this person told me in Pidgin English, but I'll translate what he said. He basically said, are you the first person to lose your father? So he basically told me to stop being such a baby. Why are you making such an issue out of it? Your father died, so what? Wow. Well. And if, uh, he basically said, if you, feel so, if you feel so strong about it, go to court. Wow. In Nigeria, when, when someone tells you to go to court, that's a, that's a polite way of saying, go you know, F off. F yourself. Off. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, so I think that was like the first incident that kind of very rudely shocked me into understanding the reality of the kind of country Nigeria is. That not only do these things happen, but that these things happen in a way that doesn't even discriminate. Because I think we we're all aware of the concept of there being an elite and an underclass. So as long as in, you think of yourself as part of the elite, you somehow think that you're protected. But the truth of, about places like Nigeria is that there is no elite. Uh, even the people who think of themselves as elites are just one unfortunate incident away from dying like a cockroach. There is no system. There's no elites. There's just those who have some money and those who don't. That's it. And, and that was very shocking to me because so I, I spent a lot of my, my life living in, in the UK where there's like a proper class system. So I thought that's what Nigeria was. Nigeria is not that at all. Nigeria has no classes. They're just people who have some money and people who don't. Everyone exists at the same level of infrastructural poverty in Nigeria, whether they're a billionaire or whether they're, they're, they're homeless. That was really it's, shocking. To me. No, and I'm not surprised it would be shocking to you, but um, I'm also glad you're talking about it because oftentimes what I tell Africans, and by the way, David, it's not just Nigeria. It's almost, it's pretty much almost all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if our Northern African friends told us that they have the same stuff going on. And, um, you know, sometimes I tell my, fr my African friend because they think, oh, if, uh, if you just manage to be part of the elite and have money, everything will be fine for you until what you just described happened to you. Because the problem is you can be Nigeria and the, Nigeria has billionaires, billionaires yes. in dollars. Okay. Yeah. Billionaires in dollars. That's what I think people don't understand. Yet that person, the minute they get sick, like the type of disease where you need to have a serious medical team, you need to have a serious hospital, people knowing what they're doing, having a serious, you know, uh, first emergency responders like this hospital, like this, um, this, uh, this uh, ambulance. The minute you're in a situation that needs that, and sometimes you don't even need much, like you said, you can just be in a bad yeah. car accident and uh, the responsiveness of the first responders will matter. But um, you don't have it. You don't have it because we haven't managed to build nations where you have that. And so yeah. that's why I say to, to everybody, don't think that uh, whatever money you have, whether you made it, um, you made it, uh, you made it, you know, in a leg legitimate way or illegitimate way. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're, each one of you is a second away from a needless a death that yeah. doesn't have to be that way, you know, or yeah. going blind because something was not done the right way. I mean, stupid stuff like that or having a leg being yeah. cut off for stupid stuff, for stupid stuff that would never happen somewhere else. So this is why I tell everybody, you know, we better build these countries of ours because we have no way out. We absolutely have no way out unless, you know, people just uh, get out, you know, like they're doing every day in Nigeria. It's called Jap Jap Japa, but, you know, us in Senegal, same thing. So David, Again, every time I hear this story, I, I mean, you told me this story once and I think about it often. And every time I think about it, it just, you know, does something to my heart. Um, and no wonder, no wonder you and would set yourself on the path that you've been set on. So from there, what happened after after you went through that horrendous 
you know, uh, situation, then what happened? How did it manifest? How did the new David or like the awakening that happened in you, how did it start to manifest and even leading you? Why, why? Yeah. How, tell so us. I think the, the most important thing that experience did for me was that it completely disabused me of the notion that I, I was somehow invested in the Nigeria that exists. Right? It completely disabused me of that notion because my dad meant the world to me. Oh. And when he died, the fact of how unimportant his death was in the larger scheme of things, the fact that the Nigerian system, even the people who, who supposedly are in control of the Nigerian system have no respect for even their own lives, right? Because my dad was part of the establishment, right? So it's like, yeah, my friend has died, yeah, and it's just Tuesday, you know, moving on. That was a real shock to me. And that what that did for me was that it made me understand that this is not a sustainable system. This is not a, this is not a way of doing things that is going to work going forward. Not for me, not for the wider. I, I guess up until that point, I had, been, I had fallen into the trap of thinking in a strictly individual, which you obviously, which is how I was raised. You know, think about yourself, think about your family, worry about taking care of you and yours. But when that happened, it made me, it forced me to understand that you exist within a wider context, which you cannot get away from. There's just no escaping it. So if the country around you is, is going through some sort of state failure, no matter how much money you have or whatever, it's going to affect you, right? It, you know, it might sound trite that it took that kind of personal tragedy to sort of wake me up out of the matrix, but that's what it took. Right, because for those of us who are raised that way, the programming is actually very strong. That think about yourself as an individual and sort of ignore the fact that there's a whole society going on around you which you interact with in multiple ways on a daily basis. So after that happened, um I this was in twenty seventeen, just over a year later, toward the end of twenty eighteen, I had the opportunity to start doing some sort of um opinion writing work with some Nigerian publications. This wasn't investigative journalism. These are just columns, opinion columns, editorials. But I saw it as a voice that I had. I didn't necessarily have a vision for how to use it to sort of force some change in the society that I lived in, but I just saw it as a voice that I had and that I was going to use this voice to call out the, the, the lack of capacity that the system existed because I still lived in Nigeria at the time. So I wanted to use that voice to call out the lack of capacity that existed because I thought at the time that the way to make my point was to point, was to point out to the people in power or the people in and around power that, hey, this can happen to you as well. So I guess unlike what most columnists or whatever we're doing, I wasn't trying to appeal to the common man on the street. I wasn't writing for the common man on the streets. I was writing for people in power and for the upper middle class, the comfortable, the, the sort of the Twitter classes, if you like. Niger, that's who I was writing for. I was trying to spark them into some sort of understanding that there are so many things which are unacceptable and which you e exist with on a daily basis that you should not exist with. And I was doing that for a few months. And then I guess what the game changer, what happened that kind of took my life, you know, in the direction that it went was, my cousin, his name is Joseph, he's, he's a doctor. He had just, um, he was one of those people who left Nigeria, you know. So he, we have this thing in Nigeria called the, the, the National Youth Service Corps. So after finishing your university degree, you spend a year on placement anywhere in the country. Like you get put, placed by the government, usually working in a hospital or a school or whatever, depending on what you study. So he was a doctor, so he got posted to uh, a general hospital in Lagos called Badagru General Hospital. It's in a town called Badagru on the outskirts of Lagos, right on the border with, with Benin, right? And this is a general hospital that services maybe, in terms of geographical spread, maybe an eighth of the land mass of Lagos. It's a very important hospital. And when he finished, he didn't want to stay there at all. And he was able to process his papers. He moved to the UK. He's now practicing in the UK. But just before he left, he told me that, you know, you're a journalist, right? There's, there's a story that I want you to tell. So he put me in contact with some of his former colleagues at Badagi General Hospital. 
I was able to get pictures, visuals. I was able to get recordings. I was able to get testimony from these people. And it was a terrible story. So this was a hospital where the, the mortality rate for women doing cesarean section deliveries was four in 10. Wow. So wow. out of every 10 women who needed CS to deliver their babies, four of them wouldn't walk out alive. This was a hospital where the doctors didn't have access to basic supplies like gloves. So if you're a patient coming in to be admitted to that hospital, you need to buy all your supplies with you when you're coming. The hospital pharmacy was permanently out of stock. But very curiously, there was a private pharmacy nearby, which was never out of stock. So as a patient coming into the hospital, you need to buy all your supplies. You get a note from the, the prescription from the hospital which you will then take to the private pharmacy outside the hospital, buy everything you need, and then come back to the hospital. The, the, the water wasn't running in the hospital. You know, the international standard for doctors is they must wash their hands on the running water. There was no running water, so doctors had to use buckets with bailers to wash their hands, which is against best practices, because that in itself can aid the spread of pathogens. Mm -hmm. There's so many things. So many things are wrong with this hospital. There was a huge absence rate. Um, a lot of doctors weren't, simply weren't showing up to work. People were combining their work there, which they were getting paid for by the government, uh, with private work. So they were doing like locum shifts, which would clash with their shifts at this hospital, and they wouldn't show up to work. All sorts of crazy things were happening. And I did a story about it. This was in August 2019. That was the first ever investigative story that, that I did. And it didn't go like... It didn't get as much attention as I hoped it would, but it got the attention of the Lagos State Health Service Commission. Um, it made enough of a, a furore on social media to get their attention. And then they started doing um, un unannounced inspections of this hospital. So a few people got fired. The hospital pharmacy was forced to you know, start you know, stocking up some of these supplies again. The hospital generator, which wasn't working at the time, was fixed up because that was another problem. There was no electricity in the hospital because the generator wasn't working. Others, some minor operational issues were fixed. And then the maternal mortality rate for CS went down from 4 in 10 to 2 in 10. So it's hard. 2 in 10 is still way too many. It should be 0 in 10. But, it's still, but you saved lives. You saved lives. Yeah. And when I hear what, you, what you're explaining, I'm like, David, are you sure it was only 4 out of 10? people dying because what you're explaining i wouldn't be surprised it would be eight out of ten this well, is the official the official figure said four out of ten it, it was probably more it was probably mm -hmm. more. They, they admitted to it being four out of ten so it might have been six it might have been eight who knows so but there was that much of an improvement and what that did for me was like there was like this light bulb that went off above my head that so you mean i sat down on this laptop and i wrote something and I put it out there. And because I did that, someone's life was saved. Mm -hmm. And that, from that moment, like there was no, there was no turning back. The very next month, um, there's a lady called Mercy, Mercy Abang. She ran, she ran a popular online platform called Newswire, newswirengr.com. I kind of knew them from a distance. I'd never worked with them, but she reached out and she said, I like the way you write and I want you to, to do something for me. So, she had this story that she was working on. It was a story about how the there was a there was a, a government agency in the federal capital in Abuja that was going around harassing young women, throwing them in jail on, sus on suspicion of being prostitutes and whatnot. Very horrible story. And she said she wanted she'd done the work, but she wanted me to actually draft the story because she liked the way that I wrote. And I saw what she had, and I, I said, you know what? I think I can do more with this story than just draft it nicely. Like, can you give me all the information that you have? So she gave me everything. She gave me the recording. She gave me access to, to, to the victims, to speak to them. She gave me the transcripts of testimony. And I basically created what would, what was like the beginning of what would later become like the style of story that I do, where it's sort of, mixed with audiovisual inserts yeah. and the, the the way the story is written specifically to capture your attention and to keep you reading to the end. So it's not written in standard news format. So that's reported speech, five Ws and the H. It's written almost like a like a crime thriller almost. 
yes, for the specific your, your purpose. Your writing is, is outstanding. Yeah, your writing is outstanding and so unique. Abs yes. So that was like that was my first attempt at that, and it was extremely successful because within a few weeks of this story coming out, the, first of all, the the person who was responsible for this thing, it was a an agency called the Abuja Environmental Protection Bureau, which apparently was being headed by a lady called um, Hajia Safia Umar. She was some sort of Islamic fundamentalist who was using her religious views, imposing her religious views on the agency that she was heading. So she got fired. Um, and then one of the victims of my story who filed a civil lawsuit against the, the, the FCT ministry in court, she actually won her case and she was awarded compensation. And in the, the ruling, which was delivered in November 2019, which was two months after the story was published, the judge actually mentioned my story in the ruling. So what I then did was like, I then knew from that moment on that regardless of how financially unrewarding this thing is, I want to keep on doing this because yes. I've proven to myself twice in a row now that by creating something on my computer, I can improve the, the, you know, the situation of, of the, the society around me. So I want to keep on doing this. So um, I signed a contract with Newswire in December 2019. So it was a contract to produce five investigative stories every month financially it was <laughs> it was basically nothing because each story i was i was earning twenty thousand naira for a story five stories in a month that's hundred thousand naira but at the current exchange rate that's about a hundred dollars so it was literally nothing <laughs> it's absolutely nothing but i was just thrilled at the opportunity to have access to a big platform because this is why i had quite a big reach and be able to tell stories that for some reason no one else seemed to be telling, no one else seemed to be touching, and have this sort of outsized impact. I really wanted to do that. So from January 2020, that was when this kicked off in earnest, when I was like, okay, I literally came back from the Christmas in 2019. I sat down in my office and I said, this year it's me and these people, you know, whoever oh. these people are. Ooh, yeah. Who are these people, David? Who are me and these people? Sounds very... Very like ready to so, go. Who are these it people? was in my in my understanding then, and in my understanding now, it was the Nigerian establishment. So that could be people in government. That is also people in private sector, because in Nigeria there isn't there isn't so much. Uh, it's not so much a case of there being an oppressive government as there being an oppressive establishment. So there are people in government, and there are people outside of governments who work hand in hand to keep things exactly as they are because the status quo for whatever reason they think is beneficial to them. Things should just remain exactly as they are. And I thought to myself that these these people are the enemy. And the way to fight this enemy is to use exposure. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. And since something else I was rapidly starting to understand was that the wider Nigerian media space wasn't telling these stories because the Nigerian media space is heavily compromised. People are incentivized to not tell certain stories, to not go in certain places, to not mention certain names, and to not, even if, even if they do tell the stories, to not tell them with the ferocity that the story warrants, to sort of water down the story and make it, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this, right? This is not an investigative story per se, but this is an important story nonetheless. And I'm going to mention names, so, you know, <laughs> feel free to... To approve no, or disapprove. This is, this is your, your interview. So you say what you need to say and right. put it out there. Yeah. So there's a, a popular online newspaper, or well, let me not say popular, a legacy online newspaper in Nigeria called Premium Times. They did a story sometime in 2021. And it was a story about. So basically, in, in the Nigerian sugar industry, there are two major players. There's Dangote, I'm sure you're aware of that. And then there's uh, a smaller player called BUA. Now, supposedly, they both have sugar refineries in Nigeria, supposedly. Um, Dangote is more of an import and distribution person, but also has a sugar refinery, which, depending on who you ask, is or is not working. Who knows? And apparently, um, Dangote was trying to lean on the government, which obviously the company had very close ties with, to essentially artificially throttle the UA, to throttle its, its competition using state power. Right. And BUA did a press release about it. They raised the alarm about it. And Premium Times did the story. And the headline that they used to report the story went something along the lines of 
uh, dispute between Dangote and VUA takes new turn as he had a, before you finish reading that headline, you've already like moved on to the next story. Yeah, next. Yeah, you, you have no idea that that story you just swiped past is one of the most important stories in, in the news that day. This is a story that could literally determine the price of your food next month. That's right. Especially sta staple food. Sugar is a staple yeah, food for many Africans. Exactly. This is a and the fact that this is this is a a, mon a, a monopoly in 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 a you know a, a company that aspires to be a, a monopoly in the trade of a an essential commodity like sugar is using state power to distort the markets. That's a very important story. But then it's reported. It, it, most of the mainstream media didn't even report it at all, and the few that reported it reported it in a way that sort of watered it down. So no one actually got the import of it until I highlighted it. Like, do you people know what this is that these people just reported? Are you aware of what this means? Then I sort of did a, like an itemized breakdown on Twitter. And then all of a sudden, everyone was up in arms. How can this happen? Yada, yada. So that's what I mean. That's how the Nigerian mainstream media works. They either don't cover the story because they're incentivized not to, or they cover it in a way that kills it. Yeah. So I was determined to do the exact opposite. And that's, I think, what I've been doing successfully for three years now, three and a half years. But, but I mean, David, you know, you, you guys at least have two. And when it comes to the sugar company, suppose you have two companies, at least, you know, Senegal, we have one, one company that had that had negotiated with the government a 100 year monopoly plan. So in right. Senegal. It's this company um, that's owned by a foreign family. I think they're from Switzerland, the Mimram family. And the, all the sugar that's consumed in Senegal has to be, the first sugar that's consumed has to be from their company that for which, by the way, our country gave them land for. Gave them land for so they can grow the sugar can. And uh, they've gotten so many, you know, help from the government. Um, but no sugar can come into the country until they have, uh, you know, sold all of their sugar. And then after that, yeah. then at the government level, the government level, they decide, oh, okay, uh, how much more sugar does the market need? So we're going to open port for that much more sugar to get in, you know, the customs. And then as soon as we have that much sugar in, then we close the port again and how they do, you know what I mean? So I, I, I didn't know that uh, Nigeria had this. It's just insane. And the reason why I go, I'm glad you got, you went into this. And the reason why I'm fortifying what you're saying is because I think many people listening to us, whether it's the Africans or the non-Africans, when, when, when someone like me sits here or you, and we talk about the nonsense that's going on, um, you know, they just have no idea. So it, there's no reason why any company should have a monopoly on pretty much anything let alone especially on staple foods like sugar is for so many African nations. The market is being distorted to no end. And then when I hear people say, oh, what do you mean you don't want any, you know, you want less regulations? Uh, are you saying you want less affair? I'm, I'm just, and when people saying Africa is the land of no, no laws, that's why everything is happening like this. But no, this is the opposite. There's just so many of them. But in any case, I could see I if I were in your shoes, David, I would be so um I would be like, you know, of course you could not never put your pen down. Of course you could never put your computer down. Because like you said, you your work is having real life result. And what I love the most about what you do and have done so well is um put stories in a way that our African people can pay attention to see that's you have a problem because when you look at how the media is is made um especially in africa it seems like it's still a media for the elite so i feel exactly. like what happens is i feel like what happens is at the elite level um they do write about you know less mundane things they write about maybe companies they write about politicians but like you said they do it in a way where they're not going to challenge the status quo because they're part of a status quo Right. And then at the, so then you have um, that type of uh, media going on at the, at the elite mm -hmm. level. And then and the way that media is done, the masses don't really see themselves in it. They don't really, exactly. you know, because the level of you have a level of education, 
the way the masses think, what excites them, doesn't excite them. You know, it's just not right that. So Precisely. there is a, they, so. they don't pay attention to that. And what they pay attention to at the lower level is maybe more TikTok. And now we have TikTok, who knows? And there it's all nonsense, it's all stupid stuff that doesn't make anybody move forward. We're not talking yep. about the real problems or when we talk about it, it's done in a way that's really not very sophisticated. But yep. is we're not moving forward. So, so, so what you have accomplished is this ability to talk about things that truly matter for the masses, but do it in a way that makes them really want to pay attention. And you also help them understand things that otherwise they would not have understood. And that to me is the magic of David, you know, and it's not something that we see outside of, I mean, I'm, I, I think except for you, I don't know if we have other journalists who write like you. I mean, if you know them, you can tell me because I know you're very good about, you know, uh, being your own critique. But I think yeah. for me, if you ask me what is the magic of David, that's what I would say. And we need people like you so badly. So then keep going. What happened? Because it seems like that freedom of speech you've been exercising has been under threat. It seems like yeah. your country was not ready for someone like you. <laughs> and yeah. So, I mean... I remember the, the, the very first time that I had a run in with the state, it was actually a family member. Remember I said I come from, a, from an establishment family. The very first person to threaten was a family member. So it was, this was in 20, so this was actually in 2019. This was even before I went into investigative journalism when I was still a columnist, but because of the sheer um, ferocity, I, I guess, with, with which I wrote, People had started to take notice, and it was September 2019. I had I'd gone to Badagri, which is my hometown, for uh, for for a holiday, for a public holiday. Because how we used to work was that whenever there's a general holiday, everyone comes home to celebrate with family. And this fellow, whose name I won't mention, but he's a very well known person in Nigeria. He used to be a, a director general of a major public agency. He has never spoken to, he had never spoken to me before, but he looked, he looked out for me. So he came with his full official convoy with the, with the, uh, the bike riders in front and the sirens and everything. And he came especially to look for me. And he said it with a smile on his face, but he could tell that he meant it. And he said that people in Abuja, that we've, they've been talking to me, that we've been seeing all this, all the things you've been writing. You've been writing a lot of things and we've been seeing that. that. And then he touched the glasses on my face. He said, have you ever been to the DSS headquarters in Abuja? So the DSS is like the Nigerian secret police, yeah. right? Have you ever been to the DSS headquarters in Abuja? Do you know that they have seven stories of underground cells? And that with these, your glasses, you're not going to see anything in there by the time <laughs> you walk there. Yeah, that was, were those were exactly. You must have no, been scared. I was, I was surprised <laughs> because I never spoke to this geezer before. And that's the very first thing he ever said to me in my life. Like, this is my uncle. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that was my first ever sort of warning that you are being noticed and not in a good way. So in, in, uh, in January 2020, um, I had a run in. This time it was the private entity. Um, it was a bank. So there was a, there, there was a story that I did about them. So to put this in context, I think their, their Christmas party, they invited like, Big artists, WizKid, whatnot. They paid millions to make it happen. And then, like, a few days after, like, the start of the new year, they, they, uh, they, they let a bunch of staff go. But the way they did it was the story because they didn't properly make them redundant. They basically just fired a bunch of people, didn't pay them their severance benefits. So people just came into the, came into the office and their systems weren't, they weren't able to log in. And that was that. About 2,000 people. And the reason given was cost cutting measures, yada, yada, yada. Meanwhile, like a few days before, here you are partying in all white and red with WizKid and whatnot. So what's going on? So I did a story about it. I didn't think that was going to be a, a big story or anything, but apparently the bank took it really personal that who is leaking information to a journalist because there was obviously information in the story that, um, that showed that First of all, this bank was not in any kind of financial difficulty. I mean, if you're paying this kind of money to host a party and then you're refusing to pay severance benefits. 
to your employees simply because you expect that they're going to be too powerless to do anything about it. There's no reason for you not to pay them the agreed severance benefits which are in their contracts and you just refuse to pay them. Like you can, you, like, you can always fire employees. That's fine. No one says you shouldn't fire them, but you know, you, it's in the contract that you have to give them so and so amount of severance if you're letting them go. If you're making them redundant, you're not doing that. You're making them redundant, but you're not paying the redundancy. And apparently the bank got really angry that I had access to this information and, you know, all sorts of crazy things started to happen. And then I got a call one day from a, a guy who apparently used to be a journalist who now works in the corporate comms department of this bank, who said that the CEO, whose name I don't want to mention, he's a dollar billionaire, um, so you may know who I'm talking about. CEO wants to meet you at Alliance Francais in Ikoi. And this was like night, like 8 p.m. CEO wants to meet you, yada, yada, yada. I'm thinking, why does the billionaire CEO of a bank want to meet with me? Because well, I wrote this story about his bank. Like, I'm just a, I just wrote a story. What's the word? Like, why is that such a big deal? And I called my editor and she, she warned me not to go for that meeting. And apparently it turns out that this guy has a habit of, um, whenever a journalist or whoever writes something about him that he doesn't like or about his, his business, he gets them locked up. So what my editor said was if you had gone to that meeting, there'd have been police waiting for you there and you'd have spent a month at Kirikiri. So Kirikiri is like a maximum security prison in Lagos. It's like the most notorious prison in Nigeria. She said you'd have spent a month there. You wouldn't have died. You'd have been fine eventually, but you'd have spent a month in there just to teach you a lesson. Uh, apparently that's what he does to journalists or bloggers who write anything about him that he doesn't like. He just keeps them for one month in Kirikiri. There's no charge. You're not charged with any offense. You're not taken to the police station, nothing. They just lock you up in there for a month. And after a month, you come. So that actually really spooked me. That really spooked me, actually. I remember when that happened, I actually, I was so spooked, I actually bought a ticket to Dubai. Like, I left the country for a few weeks, like, because I didn't know. Because then I got a call from someone else whose name I'm not going to mention. He's a security consultant. And he said, um, I hope you're not planning to sleep in your house this night. Wow. I'm like, what? And it's like he's been hearing a few things that he, he don't sleep in your house this night. And that was like, I'd never run into that kind of experience. Well, this was my, bear in mind, I was completely new to all of this. I was completely great. I had no training. I, had no, I was just sort of figuring all of this out that this is how the Nigerian system works. And this is how it deals with people who sort of stick their head up above the parapet. Yep. So fortunately, I, you know, this wasn't like, it, it wasn't my day job. It was pretty much a passion project. I was, I was running my, my copywriting agency at the time. So I had a bit of disposable income and whatnot. So I literally bought a ticket, an Emirates ticket to Dubai. <laughs> and I stayed there for like two weeks just to sort of wait for things to sort of calm down a bit. And then when it seemed like it, it had blown over and maybe no one was looking for me anymore, then I sort of crept back into Nigeria and I continued doing what I was doing. So then COVID hit. The few stories I did, this the story that I guess elevated me from being a nuisance to being properly notorious in the eyes of the government was in May 2020. Um, under the guise of um, response measures to COVID-19, the government was trying to push through this bill called the Infectious Diseases Act. Now, the thing with this act was that on the surface, it looks like it's, a, it's an act to you know, to give the NCDC more powers. The NCDC is the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, which seems nice and innocuous, right? However, what this bill actually was, they had smuggled a bunch of clauses into it. So they had smuggled clauses to basically end freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of political, you know, they had basically smuggled in a bunch of clauses and then given, made the health minister essentially an an unaccountable dictator. Because one of the clauses, I think probably the worst clause in the bill was that regardless of what happens, um, no one has any, re you don't have recourse to sue the health minister. Basically. Yeah. So basically, the health minister is literally above the law. You're not allowed to sue him regardless of what the provisions of this bill may result in, in your personal life. So even the, so one of the clauses in the bill was that, um, the police have the right to, um, to detain you without warrant, to arrest without warrant, or to stop any gathering if they suspect that this gathering or that you may be somehow facilitating the spread of an infectious disease or that you have an infectious disease. 
What, which means in practice that if, for example, you have a common cold, you can be arrested for spreading an infectious disease without warrants. Mm -hmm. It's a ridiculous clause. And it's there. It's just open-ended. And you are not allowed to sue if, you, if your rights are breached in that manner because this is unconstitutional. The Nigerian constitution states that everyone should, will have freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of, of, of association. Those are basic baked in rights according to the 99 constitution and this is a clearly unconstitutional bill being sneaked into law and then perhaps more farcically it then turned out because i actually used the plagiarism detector on the bill it turned out that 97 percent of the bill was basically facsimile from a 1978 bill passed in singapore so they basically took a bill from singapore and then used control control g to remove the word singapore and replace it with nigeria and you know, presented it, <laughs> presented it to the Nigerian House of Representatives as legislation, very potentially helpful legislation. So I was able to get hold of this bill before it passed, because in Nigeria, a bill has to pass through three three readings in the House before it goes to the president. It had passed through the second reading. It was going to get to the third reading the very next day. I got it the night before. And just as a quick aside, that's one of the issues that that later became a problem. The fact that in Nigeria. Unlike in most places that call themselves democracies, there is no system to know what is being considered in your house of parliament or your house of senate or whatever. So there's no website you can go to to find out what bill is being considered. Nothing. You need to basically have a friend who is there, who is going to send you like a PDF copy of the bill. And when I say it's not a proper PDF, someone like literally took a pictures of the bill with their phone and then like used cam scanner and they sent it via PDF on, on WhatsApp. That's how I got the bill, right? So then I stayed up all night and I did a review of the bill and I published it the very morning it was supposed to pass and it raised such a stink that the bill was later thrown out and it didn't pass. And for that, I won the People Journalism Prize for Africa 2020. However, for that, I also came to the notice of the government, like front and center for the first time that this guy is a troublemaker. This guy, someday... Not even someday, in the near future, this guy is going to need to be taken care of, hmm. right? Because he's gone from merely being someone who is, you know, calling out, you know, bad hospitals and whatnot. And now he's actually affecting national policy. So hmm. something needs to be done about this kid. So that was, that. That was May 2020. By October 2020, which was when the nation nationwide protests happened, the NSARS protests, I actually left the country in November 2020 because at the end of the protest, the so-called Lekki massacre that ended the protest, um, I was able to get my hands on some information that basically implicated the government in the massacre. And I knew that it, once I publish this story and I'm still in the country, they're definitely going to arrest me because they're going to want to know who my source was. And they, they, they've been looking for a reason to arrest me already. This is going to be it. So I left the country. So I, I, I moved to Ghana. I didn't realize that this was going to be, become a permanent thing. I didn't know at the time. Again, I had no, I was figuring this out as I went along. I had no frame of reference, nothing. And literally that's exactly what happened. It's just, it, I was supposed to be out for three, six months while I was watching what was going on back home. But then I didn't stop working. I didn't stop doing stories and the stories started getting even bigger after I left the country. So then in 2021, in, in April 2021, um, the former Minister of Communications in Nigeria, who was some basically, for lack of a better term, a covert jihadi, I basically exposed him, right? With, you know, I was able to get secret, I was able to get recordings of him saying in his own words what he really thought about so many things. I was able to basically piece together his story and put it out there in a way no one had done before. And this was a guy who initially had been planning to run for president. That was what basically destroyed his political aspirations. For, wow. for now, anyway. And I, I still wouldn't stop. Then the following month, I did a story about a, a job seeker in a five bomb state who was murdered. Why that was such a big story was that I, um, I got a, I got leaked data from, from the telecoms operator. That w and I was able to use that leaked data to basically piece together the locations of the actors in the story using cell tower geolocation and stuff like that. So I was actually, with all humility, I was 
basically able to piece together the picture of a murder before the police did so. And that was what got the case, because the, the state police division was being very funny with the case. But after I did that story, the case was transferred from the state to the federal in Abuja. And the murderer later got a death sentence. But the, the thing with that story is once I did that, then apparently the inspector general of police then decided that this guy is a national security problem. Mm-hmm. Because apparently by gaining access to telecoms records, which are obviously supposed to be you know, private, only the law enforcement is supposed to have access to them. But because I had a leak and I was able to use that leak, they then capitalized on that and made it that like, this guy is a threat to national security, yada, yada, yada. So that was where the problems first began in earnest. Um, by the end of that year, I think I had gone from, I'd, I'd, if there was a list of maybe top 10 people that the Nigerian government was try, trying to silence, I was probably maybe at number five on that list. And then 2022 was when it, like, it really came to a head because the, the, the sacred cows that no one is ever, 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 ever supposed to touch, I came for all of them, 2022. So, I guess the most memorable story from 2022 was a story that I did on the president who is now the president of Nigeria because I was able to get a hold of uh, legal records in the U.S. showing that this guy was once investigated for heroin trafficking. And he We're actually talking forfeited... about Tinubu, right? We're talking about Tinubu yes. now. Yeah, Ahmed Tinubu. This person actually forfeited half a million dollars to the U.S. government being proceeds of heroin trafficking. This dude is a drug dealer, right? And for... I guess most of the people who saw that story, that was the first time ever seeing such information about this person. And I guess even, even for those who had sort of heard about this thing colloquially, because on the streets, his story was actually quite kind of well known. It had long been rumored that this guy made his money in drugs, but no one had really ever been able to prove it. It was just, again, gossip. But I was able to provide the receipts, which I think was a, was a really big thing. And then going beyond that, I then started collaborating with a fellow called Aaron Greenspan, who runs Plainsight Law. And we actually instituted an FOIA lawsuit. So we sued the U.S. Attorney's Office. We sued the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, that's the Drug Enforcement Administration, the IRS, and the, um, there was one more, uh, what's it called? Uh, State Department. So we sued six U.S. government agencies. Um, so far, we were only really able to get significant responses from the FBI. So we got about 400, about 500 pages worth of responses so far in the, in the three months. Actually, no, so there have been three. So about, about 700 pages worth of responses so far in the three months. A lot of it was heavily redacted, obviously. So, you know, which is where I guess if there's one, I won't call it a regret, but if there's one thing I'm unhappy about is that Perhaps that lawsuit was publicized a bit too soon mm. because when we're moving in silence, things are happening. And then as soon as it became public knowledge that we were pursuing that lawsuit, then Tinubu's lawyers applied to be admitted to the lawsuit. And then the FBI started acting funny with us because they had, they had submitted a joint, um, a joint status report saying that they're going to release 500 pages a month to us for the next five months. And then all of a sudden, they're like, yeah, we, we never said we're going to release 500 pages a month. We said we would review 500 pages a month. And we never said that we would release everything to you. We have to redact things in the interest of national security, you know, because obviously it's more useful or it's more beneficial to the U.S. government to have someone in power in Nigeria who is blind to them. Mm. That's their primary consideration, not whether he's good for Nigeria or for Africa, but it's whether he's useful to them. And obviously, this is someone who will do anything to, to remain in power. So he will do absolutely whatever they ask of him, be that good for Africa or not. So, you know, I try not to get too upset about that because at the end of the day, that's, that, that's still on us. But yeah. Right. yeah. Wow. And um, so definitely that caused a lot of problems. But then there is one more, David. There's one more. Um, the big one about when um, there was a coup in Niger. And then, you know, <laughs> all of our friends uh, from ECOWAS wanted to go after them, led by Tinubu, 
And uh, so, yeah, please walk us through that. What, what what happened during that very? I was very scared during that time. Yeah, uh, because you were for West you Africa. Were, you I was were, scared for West Africa, yeah. and I was scared for you. But um, yeah, because they if that war had happened, I think it would have it would have caused chaos. It would have completely destabilized the whole region. It would have been it would have been the end of ECOWAS as we know it. Yes. Yeah. So please. So this uh, is this is a story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a story which is told in my book, by the way. So okay. on the twenty fifth of January, the new book. The, uh, you are, you are mentioned. Uh, breaking point. Yeah. Breaking point. Right. Breaking it's called point. Breaking yeah. point. Yeah. I'm looking for it. You are mentioned yeah. in the story because obviously you are part of that story. So <laughs> you are part of it in more ways than than even you might even be aware of. So shortly after the coup happened, as 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 you all know. Um, Tinubu got the, the brilliant idea into his head that by leading some sort of military intervention into Niger, that the legitimacy problems he was facing at home, he had two major lawsuits to deal with at home regarding the election. Um, and he was facing an unprecedented legitimacy challenge, the likes of which a Nigerian president had never faced before. And he got the idea in his head that by invading Niger, he'd get the support of the French and the Americans, particularly the French. Right, and so um, even though it's illegal for a president to uh, deploy the Nigerian military outside of Nigeria's borders without express permission from the Senate, that's exactly what he tried to do. Now, the military obviously was not happy about this because at the end of the day, who's who's going to die first? It's soldiers. So there were people within the military hierarchy who were not happy about this, and one way or another, I'm not at, I'm not at, at, at um, I'm not allowed to, to disclose my sources, obviously, but let's just say um, a top secret memo from the depart from the defense headquarters, from the office of the chief of army staff itself, was leaked to me, with the full knowledge that there's no way they're going to leak this to this journalist, and he's not going to put it out. And that's exactly what I did. I put it out. Now, the thing with putting it out was that this this wasn't just any memo. This is a memo that basically went all the way to the top. And all the way to all the way up to the president. So, um, leaking that memo, it had two two effects. The first thing was that it stopped the invasion because the memo contained extremely confidential information, information about um, troop locations, attack plans, movements, all that stuff. It was all on there. So it there was no way they were going to go ahead with it because essentially what the what they had planned to do according to this memo, was to deploy Nigerian ground forces to the border with Niger in Sokoto in the northwest, and then to enforce something called a no-fly zone in Niger. The no-fly zone is a euphemism, which was also used, if you remember, during the NATO invasion of Libya in 2011. So when you are told that a no-fly zone is being enforced, what you think that means is that they are simply saying that the sky should declare no. What it actually means is that all the air assets within that area are going to be attacked to make sure that flight is not possible yeah. in that zone. So, in other words, the Nigerian Air Force was being ordered to attack the Nigerian Air Force preemptively, right? And basically destroy their airfields, destroy their airframes, potentially kill Nigerian airmen. Like this was a, this is a full on act of war, which is then disguised under the euphemism and force a no fly zone. It's an attack. That's what was instructed. So this um, th this was well, you know halted. This was prevented by leaking that that memo. However, the flip side of that is that because of how top secret this memo was, whoever leaked it was going to be in a lot of trouble. And that's exactly what happened because. So I was accused of many things. I was accused of terrorism. I was accused of treason. Treason in Nigeria is a capital punishment. Wow. Yeah. Do you guys have a do you guys have a death penalty still? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. Wow. I mean it's not it's generally not carried out very often because most people, most governors and presidents don't want to be the ones with their signatures on the actual yeah. executive order. So you can stay on death row for decades. However, the case is different where it's a military issue. Wow. 
Was it like where, like for example, you are court martialed and you're found guilty of, of treason in a military affair? You're probably going to be summarily executed. Right. right. So I was I was accused of treason. And people accusing me of treason were not regular people on Twitter. These were high ranking people, right? So but if those no, people, but David, sorry, but there was no like you have not been judged or tried or anything like that it was just no 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 there was no point, yeah, but, it was judgment calls it was, but you weren't yeah. you were not officially tried and convicted no. or anything like I that mean, i mean i wasn't in the country i wasn't in the country so there was, there was no way for them to get hold of me to try me however for the fact that that word was being thrown around and then i was getting all sorts of threats all sorts of threats there was a guy who apparently is supposed to be a some kind of special member of the nigerian special forces and sends me a message on Twitter and like he sends me like a, a picture of himself. He's wearing like a like a balaclava, so his face is covered. But he's in full tactical gear with like his huge rifle, which is like as big as someone's body, right? And he's like, I'm going to personally cut off your head. And he's saying this like I'm going to personally cut off your head for betraying Nigeria. And like I don't typically get frightened very often because I know people say a lot of things on the internet, but this dude actually kind of meant it. You can sort of, you could kind of tell. Like, this was a different kind of menace. And at the time, I still thought, well, you know what? I mean, you guys, you have no idea where I am anyway, so whatever. I'll just not acknowledge it because that's a lot of the time, that's how I deal with living on a threat. I just don't acknowledge it because I just think, you know what, I have a mission, I have something to do, I'm going to focus on that. Whatever your reaction to it is, I can control it, so I'm not going to waste my time thinking about it. So that's how I tried to deal with it. However, <laughs> there was something I hadn't taken into, into um, consideration. So a few days before this happened, um, that incident in, in Zimbabwe took place. So I, I, I guess I really have to start the story from there. So um, I had an event in South Africa. I was invited by the Atlas Foundation to speak at the um, the Africa Liberty Forum in Cape Town. Um, because of the passport I was using, which obviously is a Ghanaian refugee passport because I was granted asylum status in Ghana, the South African authorities said they don't recognize Ghanaian refugee passports as national passports. I went back and forth with them, and eventually I had a back channel meeting with someone from the South African Department of International Relations and Cooperation who said, if you come into a South African airport with this passport, you're probably going to get turned back. But if you come in to South Africa by land at the border post at Bridge, it's less stringent there. So they're, they're probably going to sign you in there. So as long as you can find a way to Bridge, it's fine. And Bridge obviously is a South African border with Zimbabwe. And I've always wanted to visit Zimbabwe. So this was a perfect reason because I actually had an event in Harare the day before, which I wasn't planning to attend. But you know what? This is, a, this is an opportunity. So I traveled to Zimbabwe and then I got detained at the airport in Harare. And they claimed that even though it's a Ghanaian passport, Ghana has a visa-free relationship with Zimbabwe. But even though it's a Ghanaian passport, the fact that it's a refugee passport means that they don't recognize it. And I'm in the country legally, and they're going to deport me. And then they put me in detention. And then they appeared to forget about me. I was in that place for like seven hours. And then I put out a tweet, like an SOS tweet, like, I don't know what's going on here. Tom, please help me. And it turns out that that tweet is kind of what saved my bacon. Because what I later found out was that even though they didn't know who I was when I came into the country, and they just they made all that trouble for me because I didn't pay a bribe when I came in, they did realize who I was pretty rapidly. And apparently they were having a conversation with the Nigerian High Commission in Harare about potentially handing me over, which obviously is in violation of international law. I was a refugee. You can't hand me over back to the country that I ran away from. But bear in mind, this is Zimbabwe. Half the government is already on some sanctions list or the other. So international law means nothing. <laughs> so if I hadn't put out that tweet, that would have been a real problem. So that's how I got out. However, when they released me, the then the permanent secretary of the Zimbabwean Ministry of Information, a guy called Nick Mangwana, then went and put out my business on Twitter. I said, David is traveling on a Ghanaian refugee passport, yada, yada, yada. I put all my business out there. So for the first time since I left Nigeria, everyone knew where I was and how to get to me. So when this happened, and I leaked that memo, so this was, so I, I linked it on a Wednesday. 
two days later on a Friday. Now about the memo planning to go yeah, to war, where Nigeria is planning yeah. to go to war with Niger. Yeah. Niger. So that was, on, that was on Wednesday, I think Wednesday, August 2nd. So on Friday, which was two days later, you and I were on a Twitter space. I remember I was hosting the space, you were co hosting it. We yes. were talking about. Yeah, we were saying what next for West Africa in the wave of this sort of anti-French coups that have been happening across the region. And then all of a sudden, the space crashed. And what happened is that all of my internet connections went dead at the same time. So I had three internet connections. I had a, I had my, my Wi-Fi router and I had two phones. All three of them, across different networks, by the way, all went dead at the same time. And none of my neighbors was affected. They all, their internet was, was working just fine. It was just me. Yeah. And my, because I'm a very paranoid person, my my immediate instinct was something is not right here. So I didn't spend the night in the house. So I have, I have a friend. I had, I had a friend in Accra. So I went to his house and I spent the night there. But I think by the next morning, I had convinced myself that nah, I was overreacting. You know, I kind of rationalized it when I came back, and you know, the internet was working just fine. So I said, huh, you know. It, you know, these things happen. It could have been anything. So I, you know, went to bed, took a nap. I woke up around 4 p.m. on Saturday uh, evening. And the, the same person who leaked the, the memo to me, the, the defense memo to me, had sent me a message. And he goes, David, make sure you leave Ghana, like, now, like, this evening. Like, don't spend the night in Ghana. You know? And this was this this person. I hadn't even told this person that I was in Ghana, right? But he's like, make sure you leave, Just leave Ghana right now. Like, if the national intelligence agency has dispatched a plane to Accra, and they've they've also written a letter to the Ghanaian government, and you're being accused of treason, you're being accused of terrorism, which is the key thing, because even if the Ghanaian government doesn't pay attention to the treason accusation, terrorism is a thing that no one can ignore. Once you are accused of being a terrorist, you become an international yeah. racist. Yeah, Senegal so has done accused. that for, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're being accused of treason, you're being accused of terrorism. And if you have any, if you have any money in a, in a, in a, in a bank account or a fintech that is within the Nigerian or Ghanaian jurisdiction, you need to pull it out now because they're going to freeze it using anti-terror legislation. And I remember you were one of the first people that I called just to, Tell them about, <laughs> tell you about the situation. I, you're the second person I called, actually. The first person I called was a, a lawyer in Nigeria. I called Daily Faro to me. So just to sort of, in case anything happens to me, hey, this is what, this is what happened. Because at yeah. that point, I really didn't know, like, have they found me? Like, I, I was, there were so many thoughts going through my mind, right? So I packed up a few things, like, like a little duffel bag, so my most important documents, two changes of clothes. You know, and I called a few people. I called you, I called Daily Fire I called a few people whose names probably they don't want me to mention their names. So yeah. And within an hour, I was on the road to the border, the, to the Togolese border. Because if I knew that if I'm leaving Ghana, I don't want to leave by air. Because I don't know if they even have people in the, at the airport or with the, the immigration service, you know, if there's going to be a problem there, I don't want to, I don't want to find out. Mm -hmm. Because once you have been accused using words like terrorism, you know, um, <laughs> international travel, you know, crazy things happen. Oh yeah, you know. So I found my way to to Togo that night, um, and the next available flight to uh, to Ethiopia, I got on it, and yeah, I mean, the rest of the story is in my book. But yeah, so that was like the second time in three years that I was leaving, you know. Escaping from Dodge because something similar happened when I was leaving Nigeria in 2020. I left by road. I couldn't leave by air because I was on a no fly list at the time. So, yeah, that's. That's crazy, I, I David. Guess. Um, no, that's crazy. I will never forget those times. I mean, I was so worried myself. I was on pins and needles and um, waiting for you to tell me that you were safely back. You know, you yeah. were safe. You've safely made it. I think back then you were heading over down south. I don't know yeah. if you want to say the country or not, but you were when you told me you were yeah. safely in this other country you were trying to reach. That's when I finally started breathing. But um, David, this question here has to do with uh, because you know you don't you don't have to tell the story. People are going to have to read your book to get there. But mm -hmm. um, 
I want you to go into the importance of crypto for Africans, because I think so many people don't understand this. And even Africans themselves, um, the Africans who know about crypto, whenever they're told about crypto, they're like, oh, we need crypto. But outside of, uh, but for people who have not had a chance to hear about crypto, they have these suspicions about it. And then on the West, I mean, the Western world is too spoiled for their own goods. So that's what I like to say when it comes to crypto, because, you know, for them, it's a, um, it's an asset class. It's a, nice it's, a, it's a speculative it's asset. Yeah, it's a speculative asset yeah. class. Exactly. It's a speculative asset class. So they're like, oh, it's going to go up, go down, whatever. Um, very few people still, even in the West, understand the importance of crypto. So I want you to speak on behalf of the Africans who use crypto, uh, because you use crypto, I use crypto. I need. To, I think it's important that we explain that people like us explain to the rest of the world why crypto matters so much, and oftentimes is our only saving grace. So using using the events of of, of no, all just this, in I... general, what what you go through. I mean, you as as the type of journalist that you are, I'm sure you hear about your friends. They are activists uh, during during the the you know the the end stars you know um you know events. People have no idea what it is that we're subjected to. <laughs> so, I, I guess from from a, from an African perspective, the most important thing that people need to understand about crypto is that it is essentially it's borderless money and it's um, it's uncensorable money. Those are two very important features of crypto. Borderless in the sense that if I'm in Tanzania, Tanzania, and you are in Morocco, it makes no difference. All we need is an internet connection. We can transact with each other, and there is but no. Right now we couldn't. But right now we yeah. couldn't, as it is right now. Yeah. That that transaction, if it had to go, if it has to go through a bank, has to go through New York it. as it stands. It has to go through the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. You know, there's that three or four links in the chain, and it takes forever, right? So if you're trying to do a monetary transfer, like a bank transfer from Tanzania to Nigeria, that could take anything from two days to two weeks. Presently, with the SWIFT system, but well, with crypto, it takes a few seconds, a few minutes, and that's it. So, or or when, or also when, um, uh, David, um, you can remind us all when gov when the, uh, Nigeria had this brilliant idea <laughs> of limiting the amount of money one could take out of uh, the ATM every yeah. single day. That was pure yeah. nonsense. Remember that? Oh, Nigeria still has that. <laughs> Nigeria has some oh, of this. They still do. I thought they'd afraid of it. They've they've increased the limits, but there is still very much a limit yet. So walk us through what was the limit back then? Some something ridiculous. So at its worst, when it was this was like toward the end of twenty twenty two. At its worst, the limit was like ten thousand naira a day. That's about ten dollars. Yeah. So That's so what? people listening to this, you cannot take more than ten dollars a day out of your ATM. Where, where and what do you do with ten dollars? They've kind of they've raised the limit a bit now, so it's less um, pernicious. But there is still very much a limit. And if what's you try to go, with, what's the limit, uh, David? Today, I think it's about it's about hundred thousand there now. So that's about that's about hundred dollars. So for but for most people, 100. you know, yeah. for most people, that's about enough to get by. You know, most people don't even have hundred dollars in the bank. Yeah, but so, if you have a business, but if you have a oh business, yeah, then then it's a problem. Yeah, then it's a problem. A business yeah. and, 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 we're yeah. in, and when you have a business and we are in a cash society where everybody needs to be paid in cash, a hundred dollars if you are a business, it doesn't really get you far. Yeah. So uh, these are the issues with having a um I don't want to use the term financially illiterate because they're not financially illiterate, but they're act they're, they're bad actors. This is what happens when you have um such people in charge of, of your money. And in charge of your ability to do business, it's a real problem. It's a it's a break on on trade. It's a break on development. It's a break on everything. And this is a problem that one of the problems that crypto solves. Unfortunately, because I think a lot of the noise around crypto has focused on its use case as a speculative asset class. So I think most people in Africa still haven't yet quite figured out the power of this thing. I I used to say, for example, that the the so-called um, uh, uh, Pan-African Payments uh, Payment Processing System, the PAPPS, 
which is supposed to take off. I mean, it's been supposed to take off since 2020. Who knows when it's actually going to take off? The problem that perhaps purports to solve, which is cross-border trade within Africa, is a problem that has been solved by crypto since 2010 or since 2009. Because as long as whoever it is on anywhere on the continent, Djibouti, Zanzibar, Western Cape, Cairo, Lagos, Kinshasa, wherever you are on the continent, if you have some basic understanding of how crypto works, you have an internet connection and a phone, that's all you need. You can transact with anyone anywhere, not just in Africa, but in the world. You are literally connected to the world. So whatever currency transaction, the transaction limits or uh, um, uh, what's, it called? what's the term? Uh, the capital restrictions exist with your debit card. They don't matter because you don't need that. You know. So I, I for one, over the past three to four years, I don't think it would have been possible for me to, to have survived at all if there was no such a thing as crypto. Crypto is, was literally my lifeline because if, for example, you receive, for whatever reason, um, you receive maybe when I was running my platform as a subscription-based platform, there were several people who didn't have access to cards which could pay the Substack subscription, which is paid in US dollars because they were based in Nigeria. There were so many of them who said, you know what, um, I have a debit card, but it doesn't... It, I can't use it for US dollar transactions, but I can pay, I can do a transfer into a Naira account if you have one. Do you have one? And I had one. But the problem is, how do you transfer money from your Naira account to wherever you are in the world? And it was very simple with a peer to peer crypto transaction. It took a few minutes each time, it was done. Right? So it, it was this wonderful bridge that connected. And it's very important to also state that it doesn't. It shouldn't be seen as a competitor to fiat currency, right? It can be used in place of fiat currency, but it can also be used side by side with it. Because I think part of the, the problem here is that a lot of the regulators have this illiterate idea that crypto is coming to pull the rug from under their feet. And once everyone starts using, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and USDT, then, you know, the Naira is going to collapse because nobody's going to use it again. And no, that's not true. Those two things feed off of each other. And, they, and the proof is that they have operated side by side for more than a decade now. Yeah. So I think more, more people on the continent, because I think this is probably one of the few places where this thing called leapfrogging is still a thing, where it's still a realistic possibility. Um, more people on the continent need to understand the power that is, uh, that is implicit in having access to a global financial system, which is completely devoid of the restrictions that the legacy financial system puts in place. If you're an African in Africa, the global financial system as it currently exists, the fiat system knocks you out at so many different points. So if you're if you are if you're a freelancer, you want to get paid by a foreign client, they're gonna ask you for your PayPal account. Guess what? You can't use PayPal here in Africa. Most countries in Africa, you can't use PayPal. Yeah. They're going to ask you for your, your cash app. Guess what? You can't use cash app. They're going to ask you for your Zelle. Guess what? You can't use Zelle. You know, you are locked out in so many ways. And even if you have the same skills and you can compete at the same level as the global marketplace, just the sheer difficulty of being able to tra transact with you puts you at a disadvantage. But crypto eliminates all of that. That's right. So That's when... Mm -hmm. When I worked with, uh, so uh, there was a there was a news company that I used to do some work for. It was called Being Crypto. So, so it was a financial news company, and they used to pay in USDT. This was a distributed team that had people from all over the world. There were people from the Philippines, Mexico, Nigeria, UK, US. And at the end of the month, when everyone sends sends in their invoices, and at the bottom of the invoice, instead of bank account, you're sending your you know your your crypto your crypto wallet address. So whether it's Bitcoin or it's USDT or whatever you want to get paid, you specify and that's that. Everyone got paid at the same time. And everyone received it at the same time. That would never happen in a distributed workplace using a legacy financial system. Because where some people have PayPal, some people, if they're lucky, maybe have TransferWise or Revolut, and everyone else has to wait for the SWIFT system, which can take days or even weeks to so meander weeks. its way. Yeah. 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 And sometimes the SWIFT system... Your money is gone for two weeks, 
and then two weeks later they say they yeah, had to turn it back because there was yeah. an issue somewhere. It's insane. Yeah. So you know what you're saying is so true because right now my social media team is made of three nationalities, including you know. So I have Brazil, I have uh, Nigeria, and I have India. I mean, an amazing team. But the Nigerian uh, gentleman, uh, crypto is the only way. Is the only reason why we yeah. can we can have him. The bank account is not going to work for what the reason we talked about the Swift yeah. especially, and also even if when it works, they have some hefty fees, and you just never know how long it's going to take for your money to come or if it's going to get there. So, um, and PayPal, of course, he doesn't have access to it. Uh, Zelle, all of that stuff. No way, no way, no way, no way. The only thing that saved the day for this gentleman who has skills to put on the marketplace that I happen to be interested in. So we are trying to make a, you know, we're trying to work together. But the, But then the only problem that almost killed the deal was how do I get you paid? If crypto did not exist today, he would be like, like he loses that like, opportunity. He would have been excluded. He would not have been excluded because I could not pay him. I could not pay him. And so this is exactly the reality of what's going on right now. Already we don't have enough jobs in these countries of ours. So when some people are able to tap into into, into jobs uh, abroad using the power of the internet. Then if crypto did not exist today, none of that matters because we still can't work together because one party can't be paid. And I think people just don't also understand this part. So for us, it's just, it's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. Um, uh, David, the last, um, la next to last question is, what do you wish that Africans and non-Africans would understand about how is it that we go from where we are today being the poorest region in the world despite our youth and despite our natural resources how do we how what's the journey ahead how are we going to get there how do, do what do, what do you, would you say that many africans meaning like our fellow friends going on about their lives every day because it's just really upsetting for me all this nonsense um, you know, you and I are friends, so obviously there are many things that we, there are also many things we agree on, uh, especially when it comes to, I think someone like you, you're one of those Africans just like me, who's quite fed up of the story, the narrative being, oh, we're poor because of colonialism, or we're poor because of racism, or all of that stuff, or uh, even we're poor simply because we have bad leadership. Um, do you... Do you share any of that? I mean, do, and tell me what you feel is the state, um, the state of affairs in Africa. Because sometimes I get so annoyed at um, how the, the first instinct of so many Africans, it seems, is to just go for the victimhood mentality. It's just to go for the, ah, we're never going to get there because, you know, the West doesn't want us to. And, and, and then they complain about supremacy. But I'm like, you are giving them the supremacy. Anyway, just just tell me what well, you're seeing, where you're at, and because this needs to be taken handled. So the it usually boils down to a need for a very simplistic narrative. Simplistic narratives never help anyone, I think. So whether it's oh we're poor because we're colonized for four hundred years, or we're poor because there's structural racism in the global uh, the global economy, white supremacism, whatever. Or we're poor because our leaders loot the budgets and they don't do what they're supposed to do with it. So, you know, each one of these things has, I think, certain elements of truth in it. But to then ascribe the entire problem to these things, to each one of those things is very reductive. There's a much bigger picture going on. And as you are always saying, there is never a time that Africans are not in control of their own ability to determine their own future. In fact, I think one of the one of the biggest problems that I have with any with most mainstream African narratives is that it is assumed that there is some sort of force, there's some sort of external force that is bigger than everyone that necessarily has the power to ensure that everything turns out a certain way. Whether that force is some white man from outside, or whether that force is the big man in Abuja or the big man in Yamosukro or the big man in Bamako, whatever it is. I don't think these narratives, are, these are very simplistic narratives, and for, for the most part, they are, they are not true. 
right? There's 1.2 billion people on the African continent. 1.2 billion. That's the second largest inhabited continent on the planet. Yeah. That's, you know, how, how is it then that with 1.2 billion people, somehow everyone is so powerless that there's some, you know, <laughs> Eric von Europeanovich somewhere who is puppeting everything, or there's some, you know, some, you know, looter who steals all the money in Abuja, who has control of everything. No, that's not true. The truth is that there is a system or there is a simulacrum of a system which Africans and ourselves have sort of synthesized, which is not working for anyone at this point in time. And that system needs to be changed. So economically, um, you, you, you often refer to it as a sort of overhang from the post-colonial era where the assumption was that colonialism was synonymous with capitalism. Ergo, decolonizing must mean moving away from capitalism toward Marxism. And there has been this overhang from that. And I certainly agree to a large extent that that has been the case. But what I also see, particularly in countries like Nigeria, is that there are a plethora of examples showing what has happened in the instances where that Marxist overhang has been cut out and the market has been allowed to do its thing. There are a plethora of examples showing how much wealth was created, how many people were raised out of poverty. The, as at the year 2000, Nigeria didn't have an ICT or telecom sector. It simply didn't exist because Nigeria had one state-owned telephone operator called Nitel, right? And it had about, at its peak, it had about 100,000 telephone lines for 100 million people at its mm -hmm. peak. Mm -hmm. Right. So back then, having a telephone line at home, like my family did, was a huge status symbol. It meant that you were at the very least upper middle class. Right. To have a telephone line and there are 100,000 telephone lines in a country 1,000 times that size. Mm -hmm. So then, in, as of 2001, the new, the, you know, after the military era ended, the new president came in and the sector was opened up to private participation. It was deregulated for the first time. And then you had MTN and what was then known as Econet Wireless, now known as Airtel. Private participation came into the space. And in the space of, so it's been 23 years now since the first ever GSM call was made in Nigeria. Nigeria now has a total, I think, total number of internet lines in Nigeria has topped out at about 120 million. Mm. Total number of phone lines is significantly more than that too. Like, and then the ICT sector has gone from being basically 0.0% .0 of Nigeria's GDP to being a double digit percentage on its own of the country's GDP. That happened entirely outside of the state. Yeah. Entirely outside of government control and command. That was the private sector doing its thing. So there, there are examples like that, real life examples showing the supremacy of the market. And yet there are elements both within the government and outside the government, who continue to push the country toward this sort of pseudo-Marxist direction, which only leads me to conclude that it's not necessarily because they don't know or that they genuinely believe in Marxism as a concept, but it's because there is a deliberate attempt to use poverty as a blunt force tool. It is understood that communism creates poverty, and it's understood that the market creates wealth. Ergo, if you are trying to keep people under political control, or under political domination, you need to keep them poor. That is the only um, conclusion, the logical conclusion that is possible to draw. In a country like Nigeria, where there is so much evidence for what the market can do and what it has done, there's so much evidence for it. And yet, there still continues to be this push to ensure that the market is always throttled as much as possible. So even the, the telecom sector that I've mentioned now, after all these decades of success, over the past six to eight years, there has been this move to, to sort of put it under the thumb of the state. So first of all... Yeah, to re-nationalize re them. They want to nationalize them, right? Not, not necessarily nationalize them, but to put them under the control of people who are linked to the state. Oh, I see. So, the cronies. To, to give it yeah, back exactly. to the cronies. Got it. Exactly. Got it. No, but this is insane, yeah. David, because... No, this is insane because, um, and I'm so glad that you're bringing up, like, you know, the many instances where when the market was more allowed to 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 to, to do its thing, it, it delivered, 
as it always does whenever the market, you know, is allowed to do its thing. But um, so when I and 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 I and I and I and sometimes I I think about what you said in terms of uh, they voluntarily want to keep us poor. I'm I'm sure that there is um, there is there is an there is an element of that. But even then, um, they in this case is the government and who knows the all the people they're in cahoot with uh, locally and internationally. You know because all of this you know it's not just like one actor, right? I get it. But my point is. Um, then, then what's left to do there? What's left to do? When I see this, I say, what's left to do? Because you say it's understood uh, that the markets create wealth and government, you know, socialist government, especially communist government or socialist government, they, ca they, they, they cause poverty. They, they create poverty. You say it is understood. I think it's understood by you. It's understood by me. It's understood by some Africans. And it's understood by maybe some people in government. I would not even give them that much, you know, credit in terms of even them understanding what works, what doesn't work for most for the most part. But let's say let's say it's understood. Then what is what we what I feel is going on also is a majority of Africans, meanwhile, are simply out to lunch when it comes to that understanding. I think many of them, going back to what we we're saying earlier, they're stuck on what you described as the reductive narrative there's them they're not thinking market equals wealth they're not thinking that they're just thinking we are poor because of bad leaders we are poor because you know um colonialism we're poor because a white man doesn't want us to be rich that's how they're thinking none of them is pointing towards what you just said towards saying it is understood but markets create wealth so if you have so many people and i would argue it's an overwhelming majority of africans who simply don't don't get that narrative because they're stuck on the other one on the on the reductive narrative always pointing fingers to others so if you have a majority of people who don't understand that simple relationship between markets create wealth then they're never going to push or even fight for um the markets to be freed so that entrepreneurs can enterprise and build wealth. And so our people are simply not demanding anything related to freeing the market. I don't see them. Do you? Do you see them asking for that? No. no. And yeah, you, you definitely have a point there that the generality of Africans, as you very descriptively put it, are out to lunch. They're neither here nor there. They don't really seem to even understand even the importance of wealth creation or wealth generation. To them, the entire conversation is about who is stealing money, who is not stealing money, who is corrupt, who is not corrupt, who is a good person, who is not a good person, which I think is, for lack of a better term, useless <laughs> to, the, to the actual conversation that should be had. I think in the, in the Nigerian context, for example, I've, I've, I've said it before, Back in 2019, I actually used to host a, a radio program called Red Tape Africa. And the purpose of it, even which was implied by the name, the purpose of the show was to illustrate the ways or to, to push for reduction of bureaucracy and red tape and to make things run more efficient, to make it easier to do business right. across the internet, which is why it was called Red Tape Africa, to remove red okay. tape, right? I love and it. something that was was always highlighted whether it was Nigeria or it was Kenya or it was where, wherever it was it was always a very there was a consistent pattern of events so there's a new field there's a new innovation there's a new invention whatever and someone brings it into this African country and this thing if allowed to take root here could bring X number of people out of poverty, could create X amount of wealth, could create X, create X amount of jobs. It could do this. And then the government steps in and says, hey, you need a license. And then they create a law around it. And then they, they, they create this whole government agency to regulate that thing, or they, they, they put an existing regular government agency in charge of that thing. And then it just becomes a whole circus and then eventually, the only way to even break into that space at all is to be part of the established oligarchy. Because if you're a young person who is trying to break in, you know, and live your African dream, you simply can't. You simply don't have the capital to do so. This this was like a, an ongoing thing. It was so many times in so many 
different places, but it's the same recognizable thing. And what I kept saying was, at some point, for the regular African person on the street, this needs to become a political issue. That hey, that's right. That's right. That look, you people are simply not allowing us to generate wealth for ourselves. Yes. That not only do we not want to be poor, we want to be successful. We want to make yes. money. Yes. We, we we have a need for self actualization, like everyone else on the planet, and we should have a right to self actualization. That just the same way, you're always quick to mouth that we have freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of this, freedom of that. Freedom of capital and freedom of Economic enterprise. Economic freedom. Also Economic freedom. That's yeah. the freedom we're talking about. Yeah, freedom of enterprise needs to be a thing because if you have all those other freedoms and you don't have the freedom to feed yourself, then what kind of freedom do you have? You have nothing. <laughs> you know, I but I feel as if it's not a political issue yet because the platforms or the, the media infrastructure that should have made it a political issue doesn't exist yet. Most of Africa's media is owned by the existing oligarchy who, even if they claim to be entrepreneurs or business people, whatever, they're not really, they're not capitalists. Well, right, the, problem, the problem with that is that uh, people like that think they're businessmen, but business with people. They're not business people. They're crony business. business. Exactly. It's crony business. Yeah. It's, it has without, nothing to do with capitalism. It's crony. Yeah. It's crony without, without patronage from the state and without the support. They'll never make the, it. They can't do anything. And we they have so many it. people like that across the continent. It's, you know, I used to think that this was a Nigerian phenomenon until I started traveling around oh. Africa and I realized how similar it is around the continent. There's always one or two men, because they're usually men, always one or two or three men in the country who sort of just control everything, just yeah. everything. Yeah. There's always like, so in, in Ghana, there's a guy, I think they call him, the company's called Zoom Lion. They, basically, any kind of civil engineering, public contract, whatever it is, the fingers are in everything. And it's just one guy, you know, in Nigeria, obviously, you have your dangotes or whatnot. Every single thing, you know, commodities, oil refining, imports and exports, distribution, retail, everything is just some one guy. In yeah. South Africa, yeah. you know, maybe South Africa is a more is a more developed economy, but there are people who are trying to use state capture to create their own monopolies there too. That's right. In Zimbabwe, in Kenya, you have the same thing. So it's like, this is not capitalism. This is not freedom of enterprise. This is cronyism. It's crazy. But I, I don't think I don't think people understand that there's a difference between the two. But but you, you know, because... and then no, no, and, no then, go ahead. And, then David, and then David, you you see now why to me the reason why I put myself out there with even you know the things like the book The Heart of a Cheetah and the reason why also I have so much uh, affection for you and your work and putting yourself out there every single day speaking on these things as well. It's because I think, like you said, uh, in, lieu, in lieu of media, if that media doesn't exist yet, I think some of us just have to get up and de facto be media ourselves or whatever it is. That's, that's the reason why I, in a way, I never really cared about the social media, to tell you the truth, up till maybe a couple of years ago. Before that, I was a tourist on social media. You know, I don't even know why people were following me on social media because I was not doing anything, especially on Twitter. But it's only recently that I said, you know, something has to be done because while, you know, I stay out of here, um, the narrative has been, has been hijacked by, you know, the other side, by, you know, these typical reductive narratives. And um, so I think there is a big job of, of awareness. We, we literally have to make sure that as many Africans as possible unlearn these reductive narratives and learn the correct narrative and then equipped with that understanding that wealth is created by entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs need economic freedom in order to enterprise until more people know this and go then to make it, like you said, a political issue, nothing is gonna happen. And this is what I've always been talking about. It's like, are people, need they, they, people people have a power that people don't understand um you know 
maybe minus a few countries in um, in Africa, many many of us still I don't think would want to go to war. Uh, with their own citizens. I know certainly Senegal, even with all the issues we're having, they're being very careful about how they do things. But as long as you have a population that's not uh, holding your feet to the fire in terms of creating a, gr a better economic freedom environment, you're simply not even going to act on that. Because the truth is, even if you try to act on that, you, they might even throw you out of office because they'll be like, yeah. who cares? You know what I'm hearing today, David, is what I hear from people today when I talk about economic freedom and the need for business, uh, um, for a better business environment. And you talk about, uh, you know, and then they, hear, they even hear of a doing business environment. Do you know what I hear people tell me? Whether it's an older lady whose son just died at sea trying to go to Europe to get a job because that kid could not get a job in Senegal. So whether I'm talking to that mom who just barely finished drying her tears, or I'm talking to a young person that's about to get on a boat himself or herself for the same reasons to go look for work somewhere else because we don't have a job back home. Do you know when I start talking about, they just, their eyes roll over. Roll over. Yeah. It's like, it's like, so the old lady would say to me, the older lady would say to me, child, why do I care about the business environment? What does that do for me? That's just something for multinationals. It has nothing to do with me. My son just died. Has, I, I don't see the links until we speak more. And then she's like, oh my God. And then the young person, same thing. He's like, well, why do I care about economic freedom? Why do I care about all of this stuff? Business, what do I care? And the same thing. He thinks, he thinks it's just um, you know, for big business, whatever. None of his business. It, this doesn't touch him at all. And these people have no idea the direct relationship between, in this case, the direct relationship between this woman's son who died, like I said, and she barely finished drying her tears, and this other kid who is about to take a boat. These two people, until and unless they understand the relationship between the very tragic lives of theirs and the doing business environment, economic freedom, until they get it, nothing's going to happen. But once this woman gets it, because, you know, women and, and youth is very important in Africa. No one can win an election without women and youth. Until this woman understands it and, and this young person understands it, guess what they're going to do next? The minute they understand this and they, and they internalize it, they're going to go, and now you're going to see uh, during political campaigns, some candidates are going to run on the fact that they're going to they're going to sanitize the business environment so that entrepreneurs can enterprise. But sorry, David, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying, I actually gave a TED talk about something related to this, where I said that one of the issues poisoning political discourse in Africa is this thing called the, the Wakanda complex, <laughs> where there's this idea that the primary economic issue with Africa is that Proceeds from natural resource sales are not equitably distributed. Mm -hmm. And I took issue with that by simply pointing out that, first of all, the so-called natural resource wealth is really not as much as you think it is. The money generated from it is really not as much as you think it is. If it was equitably distributed, which it's not, but even if it was, it would be negligible. It makes no difference. The pie is simply too small. Yeah. So what you should be think, what you should be looking at is the energies and the efforts of the ordinary people on the streets, how to make those people more productive. That's where the economic uh, uh, rocket fuel is in Africa. It's not in the crude oil and the gold and, you know, stuff lying under the earth, right? And I think these are some of the things that, the, the sort of bad ideas that we've been fed for a long time, which need to be attacked. I don't know exactly how they're going to be attacked because to some extent it seems as if many of these things are very, very deeply rooted in the modern African psyche that the idea that Africa is a resource-rich continent and that's the first thing they used to know about Africa. Which, yeah. That kind of poisons everything. That, that kind of colors everything else <laughs> when we're trying to have this conversation. People don't even understand what good governance what good governance means in an African context. What you just explained about the nexus between economic freedom and people ending up dying off the coast of Lampedusa. Like, the reason people can't make that connection is because in their minds, what constitutes good governance is that this person was voted into office and he promised to fix this road and he fixed it. Or he promised to build this school 
and he built it. You know, and for doing something that he ought to do with, I mean, public money, it's not his own money. He therefore needs to be worshipped and, you know, paid obeisance to, as though he's doing you a favor, right? And they don't really even understand that if whoever it is that is governing you that hasn't done anything about how to give you the power to make money, to, to create wealth for yourself, that that person hasn't done anything. That yeah. Good governance is not a function of um, municipal competence. It's not by who keeps trash off the streets, who, who repairs the potholes on the road. Those things are just, they are regular functional things that are not, those are not accomplishments, right? What made Lee Kuan Yew a legendary prime minister in Singapore? Wasn't that he repaired the roads in Singapore? I mean, he did, obviously, but that wasn't the thing. What the rocket fuel that turned him into a legend was that he essentially revamped the entire business model of Singapore using the powers that he had available to him as a prime minister. He changed their legal system. He changed a lot of things that made Singapore more competitive. It's as simple as that. But that basic nugget of understanding I don't know how long it's going to take before it sort of permeates into mainstream African political discourse because it really hasn't got there yet. Um, and a lot of people on the ground still, for whatever reason, think of wealth creation as almost like a crime. Like the way um, entrepreneurs or, you know, hyper successful people are thought of, it's almost sort of fetishized in a way. People don't really see themselves in that space that you're a 26 year old person who has an idea and you can take it somewhere and build a prototype of this idea and show, demonstrate that it works, that you can get venture capital to scale this thing and then you can become a billionaire by 30. Someone born in California can aspire to do that. But because you were born in, in Kilimani, somehow, you know, your story is different. Somehow you are not allowed to aspire to that. You know, these are the things that I think this media platform of the future, which hopefully I may have some kind of role in, in midwifing in the future, this media platform should make front and center. I've described it before as a, a militant pro capital radio station that needs to, because I, I think radio is the vehicle of, well, as I went, I, I, I made this statement. I, I thought of radio as the vehicle of the, of the people, the media channel that reaches yep. the most people in, in Africa. I don't know if that is still the case, but what I had in mind was a sort of. I think it is. Sorry? I think, yeah. I think radio still is. Uh, that's why I'm going to be doing um, uh, this year, uh, towards the end of the year, maybe a radio tour. Radio is still the, one of the bigger, you know, um, vehicles in Africa. Mm. Yeah. So the idea that I had was some sort of, the way during the military era in Nigeria, there was this thing called Radio Free Kudarat, which was basically an insurgent pro-democracy um, radio station, which broadcasted using, I think, shortwave frequency. So it could reach very long distances. There needs to be something similar now because the fight is different now. Now, with the pro-democracy fight has been won, quote unquote. We hold elections every four years. There's no military dictator who's shooting people in the streets, supposedly. So, you know, but unfortunately, the, the lot for the majority of people hasn't really changed. In some cases, it's actually worsened. So clearly, mm -hmm. so clearly, there needs to be another fight that is to be fought. And that fight is the economic fight. Now, the economic side of the political fight. Yeah. The electoral side has been won. We hold elections every four years now. That's that that's settled. So now the economic side of things, there needs to be some sort of insurgent information campaign to give people the 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 um the informational tools they need to even know what constitutes the political issues that they should be voting on or the things that they should make their political issues. Because I feel like in Nigeria specifically, I can speak for Nigeria Nigeria specifically, there's very little awareness of this. People don't understand that the primary role of a government in the post-colonial African setting is to create the circumstances for Africans to reach self-actualization. And that the primary way to do that is using policy as a lever to enable people to create wealth for themselves. That, that awareness is non-existent in Nigeria. People think that a, a good government is a government that builds roads and bridges. 
puts up lots of shiny concrete stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm excited to hear about all of this. That's definitely uh, the journey, you know, uh, we're on. It's just, um, and as you know, it's a lot of insults. <laughs> It's a lot of insults. People are so, the identity, it's almost like um, this victimhood has become part of our identity. And when you take this uh, bandaid off, it really hurts. And, oh, it's it's been an interesting journey, but I look forward to, um, to, to whatever it is that you're going to be creating on that on that uh, on that side, uh, keep keep me posted. Definitely something I would love to um, you know collaborate with you on. We got to have all hands on deck. Um, our people need to understand what's going on, and um, in the meantime, you know, um, I'm working like I said on these startup cities where we can really um, have zones next next generation special academic zones that have embedded in them all of this good business environment that we talk about but it needs to be at the, at the, at the, at the global um it needs to be a world-class standard we cannot w w anybody existing today exists within a global village and so when you exist within yeah. a global village you cannot afford to have a subpar you know economic zone and think uh people who get to choose from the whole world are going to come to your 80s, exactly. or 90s software, 80s or 90s software ran you know um special economic zone and this is a problem because all of these special economic zones you see 20 there are 20 million of them i'm, I'm exaggerating but there is quite a number of them in africa and then people are like well that doesn't work because they tried special economic zone it doesn't work first of all we got two we got very late in the game of special economic zones and and we even then um we're running on old old ass software and so there's just no reason or no way why we would capture any investment that has the choice to go to the cutting edge ran um you know yeah. special economic zones so no so this is very this is very uh important david so yeah so david is there it's been a like i said a fascinating conversation i i i think you we're gonna have to have you back on just to talk some more because i, I we didn't even get into energy we didn't even get into you know to talking more about how uh we're gonna get um, you know, like, like we're talking about our people to really wake up, finally wake up, you know, yeah. uh, we didn't talk about any of that stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely going to want to see if you can come back. Let's work on something like that. Um, meanwhile, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up, uh, today, David, but we did not get, get the chance to get into that you really wanted to put out there. We'll make sure to share your website. Uh, your, you know, you'll share with us, which website you want us to share with people. Um, you know, anything you want to share your, your book that is already out the upcoming book, we'll share all the links and also your TED talk will share it with people. Um, okay. so just, I mean, so my... we'll make sure to put it yeah. in. Yeah, sure. My my existing book is called The Jungle. Um, I have a copy of it here. Um, it's available on Amazon. If you're outside Nigeria, I'm on Roving Heights. If you're in Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. it's a book that tells the story of the first half of, of my career as a journalist. But my second book, Breaking Points, which comes out on the 25th of January this month, um, it tells the story of the second half. Which so obviously it's a lot bigger. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot more. It was a lot more difficult to write, and I guess it's a lot more fun to read. Um, mm -hmm. My my TED talk. The title of my TED talk. You can go to YouTube and Google uh, "Death to Wakanda." That's the. We'll put that's the, the link. Title. We'll put, yeah, yeah, we'll put the link for people. Mm -hmm. And the like, I guess the, the last thing that I wanted to mention. This is just an observation. Is for the benefit of the the usual, you know. Um, the emotional crowd who obviously love to you know, insult you, as you put it. Um, I just think it's important for everyone to understand that at the end of the day, we're, we are actually on the same side. We actually do want good things for our continent. It's just that, I guess, some people see a bigger picture. Some people see a smaller part of the picture. But it's important for people to realize that at the end of the day, we're all kind of working toward the same larger goal. So when they see people who are very driven, who are very motivated and who are very clear about where they are heading and why they're heading there. I think it's more, it's more um, useful to actually sort of take a, take a step back and re-examine what your position is if you respond very viscerally to that. Why am I so angry at this person? What is this person doing that is upsetting me? And I think if you do that more often, then you might actually, you might even change your mind someday, who knows? So you know, just putting that out there. 
Well, thank you. And I hope that uh, I call them those in the back. For those in the back who are the ones who react like this, they just get so upset all the time. Next time you find yourself being super upset and viscerally reacting, remember what David said. Take a step back. Think about why are you so ticked off by this? And uh, maybe the answer will start to come to you. Thank you so much, David. It's been such a joy and pleasure having you. I, as you know, I love talking with you. Um, you know, so keep up, keep up the great work. Keep up the good fight. I am so happy that you are on this earth. I'm so happy that, uh, and I'm so proud of everything that you've been doing and even more proud of everything that you will be doing. And yes, get some rest, get yourself back to, you know, together. You deserve it and uh, come back stronger and um, for bigger things because, you know, we, we have big, big stuff still to, to do. So uh, I wanted here in front of everybody to just really congratulate you for everything that you've done and uh, encourage you to, um, you know, take care of yourself and come back soon to all of us and, you know, keep up, keep up the good work. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome.